Thank you so much, Rachel. And um, so um, let's, I'd like to now introduce Travis Eakin and I'm gonna let you introduce yourself and um, give your paper and then um, sort of on the fly, I'll, I'll adapt my comments and we're glad that you've made it to us. And we do have till 10 o'clock and we only have the two of you. So that will give you some time. Um, and thank you to the audience for those questions. And I hope you'll continue to stay with us. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I want to apologize to you and to everyone else on the, uh, on the, the chat here. Uh, when I saw the, the time slot, I assumed that since the meeting was originally going to be in New Orleans and I'm in Arkansas, that it was all in central time. And well, you know, we've all heard that what happens when you assume things. So, uh, so my, uh, again, my sincere apologies to everyone for uh, coming in here late and all of that, um, but I'll uh, just continue on and uh, give my uh, paper like I was originally going to. So, okay, so um, as you've seen, uh, my uh, uh, paper is labeled uh, German Patriot, German Traitor, Friedrich Against Nationalism and the Making of the German Confederation, which is a bit of a spinoff from a, uh, dissert, my dissertation that I completed in 2018. So, <clears throat> two centuries after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the exact nature of the settlement that reestablished peace in Europe, a peace known as the Restoration, continues to be debated. That it was fundamentally a reaction to the changes of the Revolutionary and Napoleonic eras is undisputed. Less clear is the question of how the Restoration's architects, those present at the Congress of Vienna and its constant courts and capitals throughout Europe, intended to respond to these changes. Traditionally, it has been described as an attempt to turn the clock back to 1789, to restore the old regime and the authority of throne and altar. Of late, though, there has been a reinterpretation of this period with new histories depicting the Restoration as a time of cautious reform and socio-political adjustment. These include Brian Vick's excellent account of the Congress of Vienna and Wolfram Seemann's masterful biography of Clemens von Metternich, effective head of government in the Austrian Empire and often considered synonymous with the Restoration in Central Europe. In these and similar works, the Restoration's political and philosophical leaders, though undoubtedly hostile to popular revolution and pure democracy, appear as pragmatists who were by no means inflexibly opposed to some political role for the public sphere or even to a degree of constitutional government. That the restoration was not merely a futile effort to nullify the last quarter century of history is now well established, and these recent studies have done much needed work in making the players of this era more than ideological caricatures. This does, however, raise a different problem. If the men and women who created the restoration were after cautious reform rather than a reversal of the various aspects of that quarter century, was there a restoration at all? In partial answer of this question, I will be addressing the career of the individual often considered Metternich's right-hand man in shaping the restoration for German-speaking Europe, Friedrich Gentz. Gentz is widely considered a foundational figure in German conservatism. He translated Edmund Burke's Reflections on the French Revolution into German, and his treatises against the Jacobin regime, the Napoleonic Empire, and revolutionary politics in general, marked him as a foe of nearly everything that had happened between 1789 and 1814. Much of this can also be applied to German nationalism, which appeared as a byproduct of the Napoleonic Wars and contained definite revolutionary strains with its loose talk of creating a centralized nation state shorn of the traditional nobility and embracing a measure of egalitarianism. Gintz's rejection of this led him to be condemned in nationalist circles, then and later, as a traitor to his native Germany. Treason is often in the eye of the beholder, though, and what I want to do here is not so much absolve Gintz of the charge as show that while he did have definite ideas for reforming the German political system, these were based on principles sharply opposed to those of the budding nationalists. This in turn requires a reappraisal of the nature of the restoration he was a part of. For much of the first phase of the Napoleonic Wars, up to the time of Austrian defeat at the Battle of Wagram in 1809, 
Gens was not only ardently opposed to further expansion of the new French empire into German Europe, but expressed himself in patriotic language that none of his later nationalist opponents could have criticized. In 1802, for example, after visiting the Rhine Valley, now under French domination, he wrote that if the Germans had, quote, a capital, a central point, if we, without doubt the foremost people of the earth, had but some point in space or time where we could reveal our united strength and our united splendor, if we could but concentrate on some great objective of life or of art, unquote, their cultural achievements would be even higher than they were. During the same period, he wrote to an acquaintance, the Polish nationalist Adam Zartoryski, I am not an Austrian, a Prussian, an Englishman, or a Russian. I am a German, and I am German in every sense of the word. The liberty, the prosperity, and the glory of Germany, these in a nutshell are the objectives that lie closest to my heart. It seems unlikely that in any of this, Gens was calling for a nation state as we would understand the term today, but there was a clear statement that his German identity took precedence over these more regional dynastic-based identities. And as his 1802 letter shows, it was accompanied by a definite wish for a great city or cultural center that corresponded to London or Paris for Britain and France. These expressions were to some extent an outgrowth of his older opposition to the expansionist ethos of Napoleonic France, but they were also clearly a reaction to the extreme political fragmentation of the Holy Roman Empire in its final years, it being agreed by many contemporaries that the jealousy and backstabbing among the member states had left Germany at the mercy of foreign powers. In an 1806 treatise, Gens followed up on this theme, laying the litany of German woes at the feet of its political disunity. Our fatal internal discord, the frittering away of our glorious powers, the rivalry of our princes and the estrangement of their subjects, the extinction of every genuine feeling for the common interest of the nation, the prostration of the patriotic spirit, these have been our deadly enemies. The close of his treatise was even more emphatic. Divided we fell. Only when united can we rise again. This much is irrefutably certain. Should the political strength of Germany ever become united, it must be preceded by unity of the national will. Nor did Gens stop at such abstract remarks. As a propagandist and advisor for the Austrian government during the wars, he set before his superiors a series of proposals for reversing the tide of French victory which included not just comments on military strategy, but an outline for the German state he envisioned following Napoleon's defeat and the return of independence. One such treatise in early 1809 stated that victory over Napoleon must be followed by the creation of a Bund, a confederation, with central institutions with limited but very real power, including complete responsibility for foreign policy and defense. As for the member states, even fairly strong ones like Prussia or Bavaria, Gens showed a certain degree of respect for them, but was clear that they would be forced to fall into line with his imagined Bund, preferably from conviction and enthusiasm, but out of fear if necessary. Unlike in the highly decentralized empire of the 18th century, the rejuvenated government would have real teeth. He went so far as to warn that if a princely state were to trample upon the imperial edicts, we would see them administered as the French do the Württemberg Landtag or the Bavarian police. Had events gone differently, it is possible Gens might have pursued these schemes further, but in fact, Austrian defeat at Wagram that same year and the subsequent peace with Napoleon imposed silence on him. When Gens did at last return to the subject of Napoleon's defeat and the recreation of a German polity, it was in 1813 during the War of Liberation. In those four years, he had changed his tune drastically. Now, he was increasingly critical of the plans and the rhetoric of nationalists such as Karl von Stein and Ernst Moritz Arndt, denouncing, for instance, Arndt's, quote, diabolical poems on the German fatherland, and Stein's proclamation that any German prince refusing to join in the ouster of Napoleon would lose possession of his realm. This was, Gintz declared, an endorsement of democratic radicalism, such as had been known in the French Revolution, and rather than this, 
expressed his preference for Napoleon to remain at the head of a contained but still powerful French empire. This, of course, did not come to pass, but at the subsequent Congress of Vienna, Gens would do a seeming about face on his earlier nationalism, actively and successfully striving to keep Saxony out of the hands of an expansionist Prussia, earning in the process an outpouring of scorn from many Prussians who reasoned that what was good for their kingdom was good for Germany at large. It was also at this Congress that the German states, including Prussia and Austria, were reorganized into the German Confederation under Austrian leadership and with a degree of loose central control over the members. Many of the early nationalists reject this confederation, though, seeing in it an Austrian puppet state that did not truly reflect the will of the German people and heap accusations of treason on those involved in its creation and early operations, Gens included. This raises the question, then, had he, in fact, changed his colors and abandoned the cause of German patriotism? I argue that he did not. While Gens's views evolved over time, there is an underlying consistency in his views from 1802 to 1815, shaped by a fundamental attachment to the Holy Roman Empire. Although Gens was critical of what he deemed its shortcomings, never did he express a desire to do away altogether with the old edifice. On the contrary, he argued that the structures of the empire were not only fundamentally sound, but had brought, quote, notable prosperity, elevated culture, and a happy and laudable existence to the German states and people. It had fallen not because it was moribund or decadent, but from a combination of unprecedented external aggression, i.e. Napoleon, and the selfish ambition of some of its constituent princes. Like nationalist writers at the time then, Jens was critical of the princes, but not because they had, in a cosmic sense, betrayed the German people as someone like Arndt would suggest. Rather, their crime was in breaking up the constitutional framework of the empire so that it could no longer carry out its customary functions, principally as a means for different interests to be represented and balanced, whether free cities or territorial states. Gens especially emphasized the importance of this role, describing, quote, the resolution of innumerable collisions and establishing the rights and obligations of the individual interested parties as among the first requirements of a German general government. Manifestly, the Holy Roman Empire had not been a nation state, but then again, it never pretended or tried to be one. Even in the late 18th century, it was still much the same corporate entity it had long been. In Gens's calculation, his native land would benefit from the preservation of this corporate structure. A diversity of polities, each reflecting the conditions of their territories, rather than a centralized nation state in which all of these were subsumed. In this respect, his treatises reveal a desire to resurrect some form of the empire shorn of its more centrifugal tendencies, but remaining a federal union rather than becoming a unitary nation state. Even the 1809 treatise I just outlined though it might restrict the princes in some of their external power, nonetheless left them untouched as masters of their realms. In laying out his proposals for the new Bund, he stated categorically, the German Confederation will be composed of princes of the first rank, princes of the second rank, and free cities. In no respect was his system to be derived from the people. For Gens, these princes, these corporate bodies, were the German state. Seen from this perspective, the German Confederation created at the Congress of Vienna was not at all contrary to Gens's earlier patriotic sentiments. Comparing its structure and purpose with the plan for political union drafted in his 1809 treatise, for example, several commonalities emerged. Both stressed the need for a unity of purpose between Berlin and Vienna. Both would, Gens hoped, be used to stamp out the threat of revolution even if there was a shift in emphasis from foreign to domestic carriers of the disease. Both assumed a political structure in which the small and medium states retained their sovereignty in most respects, but could be interfered with, Gens would prefer assisted, in supposed political emergencies. 
This position led him into direct conflict with the further evolutions of the German nationalist movement after 1815. For the argument that sovereignty was derived from the people had led it towards a measure of social egalitarianism on the one hand and an exclusivist definition of the national community on the other. Slogans such as an Rang und Stand sind alle gleich, the use of the familiar du rather than the formal si in addressing each other, all of this suggested a rejection of the substance and trappings of old regime hierarchy in favor of an identity based rather on voluntary allegiance and a fundamental assumption of fraternity, of equality within a community based on nationhood. These sentiments struck Gens and many others as inherently dangerous, as manifested first in the Warburg Fest of 1817, in which members of nationalist student societies, such as the Burschenschaften, publicly burned books deemed anti-German, and then the assassination of the playwright and Russian agent August von Kotzebue in 1819 by a member of these societies. Both events were regarded by Gens as the culmination of this revolutionary ideology, and to suppress it, he worked closely with Metternich in crafting the Carlsbad Decrees of 1819, banning such student nationalist societies as the Burschenschaften and increasing confederation control over the universities. Moreover, they gave the confederation teeth by permitting the deployment of troops to ensure that the smaller states enforced these decrees. In the years to come, he would repeatedly press for intervention in the affairs of member states that had, in his view, been unable or unwilling to eliminate seditious activity within their territory. While not always successful in this, he was in the 1820s generally pleased with the sort of union Germany had. Not only was it acting as a true, if limited, government for the nation, it was fulfilling its intended role as a bulwark against revolution. The restoration, of course, would not be successful in its aims in the long run and Gens himself would come to suspect this by the end of his life. That should not distract from the fact that he, as well as Metternich and others, saw their work as one of construction, not repression or prevention. As the name itself implies, they were rebuilding something that had been damaged by the storms of the revolutionary era. The most critical features of the old regime and the political assumptions that shaped it the locus of sovereignty, the nature of representation, the corporate structure of the German polity, these were as valid in 1819 as in 1789, and there was no reason to abandon them. The concept of the nation state as the natural end goal for Germany was rejected, but not the concept of the German nation itself. To conclude, the convoluted dialogue between Gens and the early German nationalists carries with it implications for understanding the broader restoration project. The more recent interpretations of that era are correct in pointing to it as a time of real political change and not mere reaction. Neither Gens, nor Metternich, nor anyone else tried to pretend things had not changed since 1789. Well, maybe the Bourbons did, but not Chris. However, in adopting this newer view, we run the risk of assuming these architects of the Restoration were content to move along the same road as the revolutionaries, only at a slower pace. Much of the evidence points in a different direction. In his blueprints for a German confederation, Jens did not advocate a more limited degree of democratization for the polity. He instead looked to the traditional structures and bases of the Holy Roman Empire which would now be pruned of its most damaging uh, characteristics and applied to the post-1815 situation. The goal was not to restrain the march of progress, but to abandon the whole idea of such a march. 19th century questions would be met with 18th century answers. This was true not only of Gens, but of Metternich as well, whose tentative exploration of a federal structure for the Austrian Empire was drawn from old regime political arrangements. The restoration in German Europe may not have been an attempt to return to the Ancien Regime, but it was actively striving to bring as much of that regime into the post-Napoleonic era as possible. And the clashing interpretations of nationhood and freedom this created with the new ideologies would define the next generation of German history. Thank you.
Thank you, Travis, for your paper. Um, I, it, it's, um, I actually um, sort of in my comments had had a couple of things that I wanted to um, ask about. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have about um, 15 minutes, so I'm going to just, I, I'm actually going to sort of, there were some comparisons in the two papers that I wanted to draw um, quickly, and, and but I will leave most of the time for um, the audience as well to, to engage you with questions. So um, one of the things that um, the papers had in common was this idea of modernity and questions of the transformations between the 18th and 19th century which I think sometimes we look at that period and it's really overshadowed by um, the French Revolution and ideas of revolution. And so we don't tend to look at the continuity of more basic structures or of social life, which is, you know, Rachel, Rachel really talked about cultural social life and you're really talking about political leadership and particularly in the German context. Mm -hmm. um, in both papers, I really thought about the idea of professionalization right? And particularly in the literature of the restoration, there's a lot about this becoming the era of profession, more professionalization in terms of diplomacy. Um, and I wondered if you might uh, want to address that with respect to Gens and Gens's role, um, how in some ways he might have been looked at as more a new diplomat than an old regime diplomat, because I think that um, you're, you're hinting at that here, but you're um, I'd like to see you tease it out a little bit. Sure. Um, the other thing that um, I wanted to actually challenge you a little bit on to think about and see what you had to say um, is about this idea of centering German nation and Germanness in in what we now think of Germ as Germany. Because, of course, as a Habsburg historian, I have to ask this question, right? right. Is um, really what this is, is a playing out of the German, uh, of sort of a German state's perspective. But how might Gens and Metternich have been working um, at cross purposes because of where we're looking at the center for German nationhood? Right. And, and how you would define German nation in that perspective. Um, and finally, my last sort of question was about your sources mm -hmm. and how the curating of the sources that you're using at the end, at, in the beginning of the 20th century, might affect the ways in which they're looking at nation and nationhood, mm -hmm. given that it's right around, you know, when nation state, that idea of nation state is emerging and also after Bismarck. So I'm going to let you go and I'm going to meet and then I'm going to look at the chat. I'm going to keep my eye on the Q&A and I'm going to let you answer. Okay. Um, so uh, the three questions, um, I'll just take the, the last one first. Um, yeah, no, part of the whole reason why I uh, decided to tackle Gens as my dissertation in the first place is because I myself noticed that uh, whole issue with the sources and what time period they're drawn from, because while there had been several uh, biographies of Gens floating around out there, uh, most of them came from the period between about 1900 and 1940, uh, which suggested to me the very problem that, you know, you just pointed out that, you know, this was an era in which the nation state was seen as, you know, the logical end goal, the ultimate good. And uh, many of those writers tended to be, uh, very critical of Jens uh, for that reason, that basically saying, you know, he's an intelligent guy, but he's in the service of a terrible cause. Uh, so that was part of the whole idea that I was uh, kind of shooting for with my dissertation, which was largely kind of focused on, on Gens and his life, which is to kind of rehabilitate him and kind of anchor him in a, a bit of a different understanding uh, about, uh, you know, what his, his goals were and kind of writing from the position of now where the nation state is uh, certainly in a much more controversial position. Um, as for uh, your uh, thing about where I uh, center against that, are you, uh, just to make sure I understand, are you kind of saying like, you know, are you looking too much at like post-1866 Germany versus Austria? Yeah. Um, and that is another point where I uh, certainly agree. I mean, 
I am more a historian of post-1866 Germany, or well, like the Germany that we know of following 1866, uh, than I am of the, the uh, Austria or the Habsburg lands more specifically. Um, but one of the things that becomes very, very clear uh, looking at Gens's career, because it, he, I should explain that he started out uh, as a Prussian. Uh, if he was born in uh, Breslau, uh, he spent his early life in Berlin working for the, the court, uh, for the, the royal government there. Uh, then in 1802, moved to Austria for a variety of reasons and uh, spent the rest of his life uh, in Vienna working for the, uh, the different Austrian governments, uh, Metternich above all. And from that point on, uh, there is a definite tension that runs through uh, his, his writings. And when looking at his, uh, at his uh, proposals and uh, this turn of his that takes place around 1813 or, or thereabouts, uh, one always has to ask the question, you know, to what extent is this really him being sincere or is he being influenced by the fact that Metternich is trying to hammer out this uh, sort of, you know, these various diplomatic attempts to kind of bring the fighting to an end maybe possibly leave Napoleon in place uh, at the, the head of a, a reduced French empire? And is there some pressure on Gens to kind of corral this German patriotic uprising uh, for that reason so that Metternich can you know, do its job a little bit better? Uh, I don't quite believe that to the extent uh, that some of these early 20th century sources do. Um, I, I think that there are these continuities that go back a long time uh, in Gens's uh, career, I mean, he was concerned about you know su such things as like preserving a balance of power in Europe well before he ever started working for Austria. Um, but that is definitely a, a, a question, you know, how far he was influenced uh, by reasons of state for the Austrian Empire. And while I don't think that like overwhelmed his personal beliefs, I do think that they were a factor in that you know he may have sometimes perhaps talked himself into believing that this is what he really believed. Um, so I hope that answers your your question that you had there. Okay. And then the last point that you made, or, or rather the first one you made, about him being part of this, you know, trend towards professionalism. Yeah, Gens is uh, very much a transitory figure in a lot of ways. And even his diplomatic career is an example of that. Um, because in some ways, he's almost kind of a throwback to the old regime courtier in a lot of ways. I mean, he is uh, very, he's not only very dependent on the goodwill of the emperor and the chancellor, uh, whoever that might be at the moment, uh, for, his, uh, for his paycheck, but he's also, uh, fawning is the only way I can put it um, in, in his approach to them. Like he is, uh, he's very enamored of the Austrian nobility. Uh, he likes to ingratiate himself with them. Um, he really does kind of act in this way that like an older pre-revolutionary uh, 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 publicist or, or, or writer might have done. At the same time, though, he is also very much invested in this idea that arises at the Congress of Vienna of having these regular meetings, embracing the different uh, heads of state and diplomatic figures from across Europe, uh, these congresses that meet during the late 1810s and early 1820s. Uh, he, in, he attends uh, several of them, uh, the one at Aachen being a good example, uh, and is you know, really trying to make these a regular thing uh, so that there can be these, these regular meetings for uh, people to hash out each other's problems and preserve this peace that existed in, in Europe uh, following uh, the defeat of Napoleon. Of course, this does not work out, but that is his goal. So, yeah, I think in that way, you can say that he definitely does encourage a, a movement towards this idea of having a more uh, professional international uh, diplomatic core. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? I'm looking in the chat. I don't see anything really. Um, and I don't, there's nothing in the Q&A. Thank you, everybody in the audience for using the chat. It makes it a lot easier for us to not have, for me, not to have to toggle back and forth. Um, is there anything, um, does anybody have any sort of comments or questions related to the two papers? I think there are 
some really interesting comparisons here about that sort of turn of the turn of the eight uh, of the nineteenth century period. Um, and Rachel, I'm so sorry that I missed yours. It sounds like it was really very interesting. Don't worry about it. I uh, there, but for the grace of God, go I with with thinking about the central time thing. Like, uh, I think it was I, a distinct possibility. <laughs> I think we all are absolutely. Um, yeah, I think at this point, it's that's what it is. Um, and we're all looking forward to being in person again so that these things don't happen. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I, I am with you. I'm flying to Europe this weekend and it's the time change. And aside from everything else, I've got to figure out <laughs> what that means, right? Um, so I, I'm totally with you. Um, any other questions, any other comments about this. Um, I, I guess I have one last question, which is, um, and it relates to something that I asked uh, Rachel, which is how are how you are using, well, actually, maybe there are two. So one would be how you're defining German nation um, here, and how you maybe see that changing over Gens's lifetime and his career. And the other is how you see this relationship to the modern or modernity or European modernity. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought yeah, that was, you said that was for Rachel initially. So no, I, no, for you, for you. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. So uh, what was the first part again? The first one was um, how you um, are defining the German nation. Um, and how Gens might have seen that changing over his career or not, and how you would look at it with respect to today. Uh, are you referring to that in terms of like physical boundaries, most obvious example, or? Well, I think nation, you know, state might be more physical boundaries, right? Because mm -hmm. it's the conception of the German nation, I guess, mm -hmm. more that I wanted to ask about. Okay. Um, so basically, like, you know, who, who makes up the German nation and who does not. Um, I don't think that Gens would have disagreed with the basic assumption that a lot of nationalists threw out at the time, that the German nation is basically um, those who speak the German language and are in some respect tied in to the German culture. Uh, he did not spend a lot of time talking about, you know, this specific question of, you know, what do I see as the German nation and what do I not see as the German nation? Um, and, you know, he didn't, I don't think that he really thought much in those kind of broader cultural uh, terms. Um, you know, I, I referenced Arndt with his, uh, his poems that, you know, Gens just hated. Um, and his, uh, his, obviously his most famous one is, you know, the, or, or the one that gets cited a lot today is, you know, uh, Was is the Deutsche Fatherland. Um, and while I don't think that, again, that Gens would have disagreed with the notion that if you speak the German language, then you are in some sense a German. But I think that when he thought about it, he was thinking much more in terms of the individual states that went into the Holy Roman Empire or which had mostly these German speakers and could be considered uh, in a sense German. Um, I mean, he, he really did spend most of his career kind of thinking in terms of like, okay, what's happening with these political units? You know, what policies are they shaping? How are they contributing to this continental wide balance of power and so on and so forth. Uh, so that was really where his focus was pretty much throughout his entire life. Uh, so when he thought about the German nation, it was as much having to do with what is its place in the overall European map? How is it contributing to the stability of uh, that map to this question of balance of power and so on? So I think that is the main way in which he thought about the, the German nation. I mean, he was definitely very proud to be a German. He, he saw himself, he says, as a German above all else. 
um, you know, since he, he was writing this to uh, Zartra Risky, I mean, there is a, a question, you know, maybe he let his enthusiasm run away with him a little bit there. Um, but he did, on the one hand, definitely see himself as a German, but also, on the other hand, was thinking not only about Germany, but about what he saw as good for Europe as a whole, if that answers your question. Um, and then finally, regarding uh, what you said about, you know, basically, you asked, where does he stand in this question of, like, modernity, essentially? Um, yeah, and I think that his his whole career kind of goes, goes, goes back to this question. Um, he's definitely a guy who I think would have been much happier had he lived and died within the 18th century rather than living into the 1830s and uh, kind of seeing the restoration come to an end. Um, so I, I think there's no question that he really wanted Europe to stay within this old regime context as much as possible. Uh, however, he was definitely... There, there are times within his career where you can see him kind of chafing against certain aspects of this old regime political system. Like he's constantly in a, a tiz because he's recommended these ideas that he, he thinks are just wonderful and great and will solve everything. And, you know, Emperor uh, uh, Francis or uh, Metternich or whoever uh, just won't listen to him. Like, you know, sorry, we've got other things going on. Um, so, uh, and I think in that sense, you can draw a bit of a comparison, and I've thought about this before, uh, between him and some of the other kind of members of the upper ranks of the, you know, the, the, the third estate, just make that kind of a continent-wide thing for a moment, uh, who are, you know, well aware of their own talent, their own intelligence and all that, um, and are often resentful, even if they are at times, you know, kind of uh, envious of, um, the, the second estate or the, the nobility, the, these, this aristocratic elite that is still managing things in so many places. Uh, so I don't think that Gens ever consciously wanted this overthrow of that whole system uh, or uh, you know, re replacement by something resembling kind of the more uh, you know, middle-class liberalism that would predominate in the 19th century. Um, but you know, one can see if, if his career taken different turns, how he might have gotten on board with that. So that's one way in which, like I said, I think he's a very transitional figure in some ways. Thank you. Thank you both for very interesting papers, raising very interesting points about a, um, a period in history I think sometimes we, we tend to overlook as Europeanists. So I was really glad to be able to see your papers and comment on them. Um, we are exactly at 10 o'clock. So thank you all. And thank you very much for um, the audience who was here as well. I look forward to seeing everyone at, um, at some more panels. And um, thank you again to everybody for coming. And hopefully next year we will be in person. Right. Have a good day, everybody. You too. Bye. Nice to meet you both. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs>